Additive Manufacturing Initiative. This is dedicated to the passionate professionals who volunteer with SME to connect the digital thread of additive manufacturing within traditional manufacturing. My name is Adam Penna, your host, leading customer engagement for our SME additive manufacturing community. Today, my guest is Dr. David Lee. Hi, Adam. Yeah, this is great. Great to have you here. I wanted to give a little background of where you came from here. I know while we're sitting here in the University yep. of Texas, but David here is the Chief Technology Officer for Additive Manufacturing at 3D Systems Corporation. And he's an experienced entrepreneur and founder with a demonstrated history of working in 3D printing and additive manufacturing. And he has got to start right here in Austin, Texas. Uh, back in 1991 at the DTM Corporation after graduating from UT. DTM was eventually acquired by 3D Systems and David stayed active in the industry since. Very active as a matter of fact. So very happy to be with you here, David. Yep, I'm glad to be here as well. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about where we're at. We're sitting here in a lab together. What's going on here? Yeah, so if we rewind the clock, we had in the basement, Dr. Beeman and Carl Deckard and several other students worked on the first laser centering machine. Yeah. And so just right across the street. So we're sitting in the engineering research center and teaching center here for the engineering school. And they have a multi-floor maker space. So, you know, 30 years later, they're still doing it. And now it's a lot broader accepted in the engineering disciplines. And so it's become a bigger space, not just a lab to invent the tools that engineers can use, but a lab that engineers can use to develop other things. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's awesome to be here. This is a beautiful campus in downtown office. So thank you for the invite. Yeah, it's absolutely. To be here with absolutely. You. Now, I know we talked a bit before this, but everyone has their first experience with additive manufacturing. What was yours? Not the super long story, but sure, a, sure. a little bit longer story. So I have a cousin that was an engineer at TI, and we knew a guy named J.W. Kruger. J.W. went to school here at UT back in the 60s and was a roommate with my dad, and he was a VP of engineering of this new startup called DTM Corporation. So my cousin called me and said, hey, why don't you meet me for lunch? Let's go see what J.W. is doing. So I was a student here, so he was working in Austin. So we drove over to DTM and looked at it. And so I saw the machines for the first time, and you could sit there and look in side and it's just like melting this one layer. It's like, what is it doing? Yeah. And then you saw this CAD model and the CAD was not really used. I mean, so my first class was really drafting, not really CAD. Same here. Uh, and CAD was computer-aided drafting, yeah. not computer-aided design. And so a lot of it was 2D. And so it was really interesting. So that was the first time, probably 88, 89 kind of time frame. Okay. Wow. Yeah. There's a lot that's happened since then, obviously. Absolutely. We had a chance to work together for a little while. So it's been good here to be in Austin and have a lot of things going and see the history of additive right here inside of, especially UT where a lot of the SLS started. So great stuff. So what would you say is the biggest impact to additive manufacturing as far as the broad manufacturing industry? The challenge that we had, I would say as far as the the broader industry, typically you have an expertise. So engineers have an expertise and they know certain tools and new tools come about, but the old engineers don't have the experience with the new tools, right? So old dogs, new tricks. Sure. And so I think the biggest challenge that we've had over the last 30 years um, is just really getting people to shift from a 2D mindset to a 3D mindset. Yeah. And that started to happen, but still most of our manufacturing methods are traditional. So it's machining, it's drilling a hole, uh, or, or shaping something or typically build complex geometries up. And so you may build a negative like in molding, you may build casting patterns, but you typically don't build the part itself just from scratch. And so I see that the biggest advent that this has really helped is really designed for manufacturing and designed for application is engineers now can have a fairly low cost 3D printer on their desk. They're actually able to assist them in their manufacturing method, no matter what it is. So it helps them kind of get the design earlier so products can come to market faster and they're able to de-risk so many things because they can prototype molds or they can prototype parts or they can prototype or build jigs and fixtures to help in the 3d printing so i think the biggest strength that 3d printing or additive manufacturing has had to date is augmenting traditional manufacturing additive manufacturing has not replaced traditional manufacturing i think that's the goal and that's really where we would like to see it but currently it is just part of the larger ecosystem so that's true and i know you worked a lot going from that prototype to production stage, yep. especially with the big service company you had and everything yep. that happened in early in those days. So talk about that. How was that whole swing where you saw where you're working with people on prototyping, but then it actually becomes a final part? 
I, I would say in the early days, a lot of manufacturing was done. We would make three or four prototypes for every one model. So typically one of the prototypes might go to the group that's doing packaging so they can start preparing the packaging. So they started kind of talking about concurrent design. So they're trying to do all the things at the same time. So all the ships come into port at the same time. The reality is, is that doesn't always work well, but the, the rapid prototyping or the prototypes we were able to make actually allowed them to do fit checks. They could send it to the tooling people so they could make sure their tool was right. And so that was really the early days, but not many parts were end use part. The first company that I'm aware of that really adopted it was DTM was working with Boeing and Navair. So Navair had a desire to put 3D printed parts on the F-18. They'd done some initial tests mainly at Rocketdyne, which was in Southern California. They had done some stuff on the F-15 and others where they actually saw that these laser-centered parts actually could be mounted on the outside of the aircraft. They could instrument things like putting a camera on there, make a jig or a fixture or something that could mount, and it actually was working. Yeah. And so they had designed some low-pressure ducting inside the F-18, and they found that it worked. But they had to write a specification for it. And so what we had to do is develop not only a material spec and a machine spec, but also a process spec. So that was a several year development with Navair and the Boeing company to do that. So that was the first experience of like real parts going on real equipment. And that was again in the 90s and it grew into uh, more applications and eventually the metals technology matured enough and then now we're seeing that stuff go all the time. Yeah. And, and you and I have both seen that. Yeah. Some of the customers, especially the space customers, I think just this week we had two people go to space yes. on the private side yes. in the same week. I would put money on the fact that parts. both of those airships had parts that were made with additive manufacturing. Yeah, it shows where we're at today because those parts have to be qualified heavily to get on those aircrafts. Uh, yeah, it's not an easy process. We all know that the qualification process that leads up for aerospace and medical is something that has to be really uh, stringent, you know? Yes, so, it does. So when you get to that final product being actually part of a, a mission, wow, you know, that's everything right there. And that shows how far that our industry has come. We've had a lot of different things, a lot of evolution over that time. So SME, Society for Manufacturing Engineers, what has your experience been with uh, in the past, especially with Rapid Plus TCT coming up? I guess a little history there. So when I was at DTM, we had a five beta customers. One of the beta customers was United Technologies, and it was really Pratt & Whitney in, in East Hartford, Connecticut. Dick Aubin was the guy who ran that lab, and he was very active with SME. Yeah. One of their early advisors, and we really started the Rapid Prototyping Association. Yep. We saw this, and he was one of the visionaries that really saw that this 3D printing, we didn't call it 3D printing at the time, we call it rapid prototyping, was really something that was different and would really help manufacturing and help design and so we started having conference and then start having a show and so when I'd started a service bureau I ran a service bureau for 20 years after DTM and so we saved up our money and we went to rapid and it wasn't called rapid at the time but we'll call it rapid for just keeping it consistent sure, sure, yeah. and I remember one time uh, there was a booth right next door and there are all these people that came in from Israel to show their new technology and it was very frenetic and got to know those guys and, and just you know when you're in the booth and you know as an exhibitor and speaker, you get to know kind of behind the scenes. And, and the company at the time was Object, and there was their first machine ever. Object eventually acquired or merged with Stratasys. So it was an Object Stratasys merger where Stratasys kept the name, but the headquarters went into Israel. But seeing those guys the first time before anybody else saw it, it's really kind of neat to see those stories unfold from just a startup until they go public and all of that stuff. Oh, yeah. And then eventually I ended up working with that group. So that was one of my kind of earliest memories was just that trade show and just getting to know all the people in all the booths. Yeah, and it's celebrating 30 years this year. Yep. Rapid Plus TC is yep. celebrating its 30th year, yep. so it's it's been that progression of what's happened with yep. the community and the people yep. out there and going from rapid prototyping to production now. So. Yep. Well, and wow. I could say, you know, what's interesting about this conference and several of the other conferences, I remember one of the conferences, I think it was rapid. I went just as an attendee. I kind of walked the aisles. I found somebody. I, I had a thing. I had a problem. And I had a device that I was trying to use. It was really expensive. And I found somebody else that actually worked on those devices. And so I went by their booth and they were able to actually repair. And so we set up a recurring thing where we would send this thing in and they would refurbish it and send it back. And just walking the aisle and running into that one vendor paid for the show right. many times over. Yeah. And so it's amazing what you can learn and see that the uncommon problem you think you have is not so uncommon. Right. And building your network is really a good thing.
Yeah, that's a huge part of it, the network, the community out there, being able to talk to people. And it shows in events like that where you can do that because it's not every day you run into those people and you have to talk about your specific problem right on the spot. Yep. So it's a great you place. can find solutions pretty quickly there. Yep. That's awesome. Now, we have this year that's coming up. It's September 13th through 15th yep. in Chicago, Illinois. Anything special you're looking forward to this well, year? Well, I would, well, at the time that we're recording this, yeah. COVID has been yes. in, in regression, right? And then since the 4th of July, we've seen an uptick. So I'm assuming that we're over COVID, but then we start seeing things, maybe we're not over COVID. But I will say this, and not to be too optimistic, but I'm just done. Mm. I'm done with sitting at home and waiting. And I think this one, because we've had to postpone it a year and then also pushed it back several months. Yeah. So it's been, I think, a year, roughly, not a year and a half, but year and a number of yeah. months from when we were supposed to be here. I'm really looking forward to seeing the people, to getting re-engaged. It's a really important part, at least for me and my career and what I do. It's a really important part, and it's hard to miss that. So I'm just looking forward to being there and seeing the folks. Yeah, that's a big part of what we've talked about, community and network. The additive manufacturing community is a bit different than other communities. How do you see that additive manufacturing community? Like what's the heart and soul of the AM community? So that's a really good question. So the way I define community versus just a standard relationship or standard interface is community is where you have connections on multiple points. If you think about your home, when you're at community, right, you may see somebody at the grocery store, you may sit next to them at a football game, or they, sure. your kids may play on a baseball team together, you know, you may work together. And so you see people three, four, five different context, mm -hmm. right? And that makes up a community. And the thing that's interesting about the rapid community or the additive manufacturing community is we've got that. You have AMUG, you have Formnext, you've got rapid TCT, you've got all of that stuff. I mean, back in the old days, and this is really old, we used to have a mailing list called the RPML, oh, wow. the rapid prototyping mailing list. Cool. And people would like throw out questions or challenges or problems. Every once in a while, you get somebody who would flame somebody. So somebody would say something and everybody ridiculed them sure. and it's like, shame them to not say that again, or they defended. So that was in the early days. But what happened is a lot of those folks that were in those have kind of extended into the newer media. Nice. And so the media that we have now with podcasts and all that, we're starting to see those start to pop up within companies. I think EOS has one that they do. I think other people I think do. they're on uh, episode seven or eight now. Yeah. 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 But what happens is we're creating all these different connections yeah. uh, within the AM space. And I will say that it's really kind of a big family, maybe dysfunctional, mm -hmm. uh, but it is a that's big a family. family. It <laughs> is a family. I think that's the key definition. Yeah, yeah, no. It is different, I think, because you have the makers, you know, the maker yep. space, and then you have actually the production space that people are pushing forward, finalized yep. parts. There's a lot of that creativity and that engineering side that gets merged together to make some pretty beautiful projects. Yep. So, Well, and to that point, they're able to showcase that at the different conferences. So, again, some of the things I like to see is people get to showcase new applications. And so you'll walk up the aisle and you'll see art pieces. Right? Yes. I think there was an art show or like a fashion show at one point. Yeah, you know? there was. And so yeah. it's really kind of cool to see the application, but it's also cool to go and sit and listen to a technical talk on how they're using, I don't know, let's say, how did Branson use that for his little space flight, sure. you know, or somebody like that? Yeah. So you get to actually listen to some of the technical talk. It's yeah. a good mix. That, those technical talks are great because it's like, yeah, like you're saying, you get to dive into a case study and deep dive yep. and see how they actually went through that process. And that's so invaluable. It's something else to be able to be part of that. And I love that side of the community and that, that side of all those events because you actually get to dig into what's really happening and learn about how you can get past or maybe avoid some of the mistakes. But I know 3D printing in general you're able to make quick iterations, and that's yep. really the strength of it, right? So I would say, with an asterisk, right, there are some of the processes that we deal with that sometimes one iteration may take three or four days sure. to run in a machine, especially when you're dealing with metal parts that are fairly large. The machines are expensive. The materials are expensive. So those iterations are really not the cheapest thing in the world. But as a general rule, you can build something and then come in the next day or later that day and see if it worked. Right, right. Yeah, that's yeah. part of it, the learning how to yeah. actually deal with the iterations in the right way. But, you know, that being said, I ordered an ice maker not long ago. Well, actually, it was a long time ago. I think it took about six to seven months during COVID to just get an ice sure, maker, which sure. is pretty simple. Yeah. And so when you think about the value of additive in the supply chain, when we see a lot of disruption within 
COVID with the supply chain. I mean, even getting lumber, getting windows for your house. Toilet I mean, paper. Very, yeah, to, or hey. buy, yeah, toilet yeah. paper. Or drive by a car lot. I mean, yes. you know, they're empty. <laughs> Additive still is producing parts. Yeah. And so that's one of the things that it's able to do is shore up, especially for the engineers who deal with long lead times in the development cycle. Yeah, that's been a big part of this pandemic. It's been a shining light to look at what's happened with the supply chain. And now different companies are able to look at, hey, this is a viable solution for well, risk think, mitigation. You know, yeah. So one of the biggest challenges in AEM, and I think that's one of the questions we kind of try to address is one of the challenges is the business case. Mm -hmm. You know, These are not the cheapest processes, especially the production processes. The industrial systems are expensive. The barrier to entry to learn how to run a machine. Not anyone can just push a button, You're right? right? Now. But the thing that we've typically looked at is business case is really, it falls short of traditional business cases. But the thing is, the traditional business case is injection molding and everybody can come into the office and they can all be in one facility and they can churn out parts and then somebody gets COVID and the plant shuts down and it's not making parts. Well, the thing that's great about Additive is it can work with just a few people right. and it can work remote. And so I think one of the things that's now entered in is almost like an insurance, right? So having Additive in the value chain or the chain of production has really started to enter into the business case. And it's not just a dollars and cents, right? right? It's can I have something that I can rely on to continue to produce? Big time. And we've yep. all felt that, especially with the pandemic, obviously. Yep. So yeah, there's a lot of different things going on. And I know we were talking about society manufacturing engineers. What role do you see SME playing in the additive manufacturing space? Well, I think the key role is connector. You're not going to go to SME to get your degree. You're not going to go to SME to get all the training. You're going to get your training at a local yeah. trade school or university. Yeah. You're going to get your training by starting to work at a company that has equipment and you've never seen it before and you're asked to run it. Right. right? So that's typically where you're going to get your training, but that's only going to get you really an intro into it. Where SME comes into play is really able to connect you to higher learning, to other people who have gone before you. So you don't have to learn it the hard way. You can learn it from others. So I think again, SME generates content generally that can be available offline. They generate trade shows like this where you can actually tactile, you can go walk the show floor, learn by yeah. doing and seeing. You can learn by sitting in a room. But the best thing is you get a business card of somebody who does something really similar. You put it in your pocket, you call them two weeks later and say, hey, I'm running into this geometry. How do you fix that? Yeah. And so, and SME has, for me, and for a lot of others, has played a key role in connecting those dots. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. I look forward to seeing that continues. A lot more can grow and side of the additive manufacturing community and uh, looking forward to seeing that with SME. Yep. So we did talk about the community itself, but there's always the next generation. We're here at UT, University of yep. Texas, and there's yep. a, you know, a bunch of the new next generation coming in and learning yep. these things. Some of them have been learning it since they were in first grade or their whole lives. So what do you think is the best way or what would you say to attract the next generation into this field of additive manufacturing? I think the number one is the virtual play. The thing that's interesting about what additive can do is it can actually make tangible what is virtual, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So we go into video games, we go into movies, we, we read books, we're in this virtual space. And so you have this imagination. But the thing is, you can take that virtual space, that imagination, and actually realize it through 3D printing. Mm. So I think the first one is being able to engage in a real way with the software virtual space. I know some, some companies have, have actually merged the two, where you can use 3D virtual glasses, and you VR can actually glasses. walk yeah. through and see machines, and, and it can actually train you. Those things, I think, work better with our younger generation. Up to this point, I would have assumed that our next generation was going to be, I'll say, unplugged. They're not going to go into the office. They're just going to stay in front of a computer and just be in the virtual place. And we're not going to see the traditional offices. COVID really accelerated that. But at the same time, it's shown, I think this generation that was forced to stay home during school, forced to stay home their freshman year in college, I think we're going to see a rebound where we're going to see a young generation that wants a community. I agree. They want to participate. Yeah. They want to go to a football game and sit in the stands. They don't want to just watch it on, on their iPhone. So I'm not saying we're going to have a rebellion against the digital generation, sure. but I do think that this next generation is going to want to be able to collaborate and work together. And one of the best tools that I've seen in this 
slab and, and you can kind of see some of the glass behind it is it's maker studios it's lots of 3d yep. printed parts you see a lot of students crowded around a single laptop working on something and then printing it and then testing it and so i really see it as again the actual technology is a connector and again it connects not only people to people but ideas to reality mm. and so i think that that's the role the thing is is we've got to find ways to engage them and that's one of the reasons that university of texas has built a core really a cornerstone to this teaching center is the maker space yeah and that's the way we're going to have to teach them to learn just like at some point it was typewriters to computers yeah right and so we had to learn had how to learn to, yep and learn so when type. kids come up they become digital natives we're not quite yet here where there's am natives right sure. so there's not people who have really been able to see it it's still fairly rare to have a real maker space in a high school mm. some high schools do uh, but most don't yeah yeah it was beautiful to walk by all the maker space here and see all the different labs because it's obviously a big hot spot for that here and yep. it's happening it is yep. happening that is a cool part of it we talked about where we're at now and where we've been inside of additive manufacturing where do you see it evolving in the next few years so one of the visions, and again, it's informed my attitude about where things are. If you look at the computer industry, it was invented in really post-World War II. A lot of it was code breaking. Then we grew from the 40s, 50s into big, massive computers in the 60s, and then in your own garage in the 70s, and then really starting to streamline in the 80s, 90s. But it really wasn't until probably 2000 or so when the internet came yeah. that really we've seen a scale of computers, that it's handheld computers, it's smartphones, right? Yeah. It's in your car. I mean, a Tesla, right? Yep, yep. It's everywhere. It well, where is 3D printing on that thing? Well, 3D printing was vented in the 80s, right? So that's 40 years after computers. If it was just a, a linear, ah, same yeah. linear scale, if you really look, computers went from basically the 50s to 2000. So it took around 40 to 50 years for it to really scale. Well, if we add 40 to 50 years from the 80s, we're really looking at probably 2030, 2040, when we're really going to see the same uptick, that hockey stick growth. And I think we're on that pace. So I say all of that stuff. How did computers do it? I mean, what was it? And for me, who grew up as a kid in the 70s, but high school and college 80s and 90s when I was a kid you had a Commodore 64 you had an Atari you had a TRS-80 you had an Apple IIe you had an Apple Macintosh a Sun Microsystems every single one of those things had different operating systems had different motherboards everything was different yeah. and nobody specialized like now like it's AMD or Intel are the chips right. right you get a ViewSonic or somebody like that on a monitor you have a Logitech keyboard so I think we saw that shift somewhere in the 70s until 2000. And so I think what we're going to see is a standard interface where common software can run any 3D printer, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, that you would have a common user interface on a 3D printer, no matter what the material is, and that you would then start getting specialization within that peripherals, things that right now you have to buy special to the system, that they may become like a generic HP printer. You don't have to buy an IBM printer to work with an IBM computer. You can buy an HP printer and work with a Dell computer. Yeah. I think that's what we're going to see is a little more focus. I think what we'll do is right now, I think people are fighting over pieces of the pie. If you think about AM as kind of a pie chart, we're fighting over those. I think what we need to do is grow the whole pie. In order to do that, we're going to have to specialize. Yeah. And you see a lot of that specialization happening, but I know over the last year too, you see a lot of those SPACs are out there. Yep. Things are going public. There's a lot of investment. A lot yep. of investment happening. That's a good thing. A lot of money being pumped into our yep. industry. So that's going to be interesting to see how that actually yeah. turns out. Over the and next honestly, year. and I think we can probably take our cues from the stock market, who is really trying to invest, that they see that hockey stick that I just referred to. They see that that's, you know, a decade or two decades away, not 100 years away. Right. Right. That's something within a return uh, on investment horizon. Now, I think a lot of people want it to happen in the next two years. The reality is things don't generally happen in two years. I mean, you could get an inflection, but I definitely see the next decade is probably going to the big, biggest decades of growth for this industry. And it is that there's so much that's happened already. And like you're saying, the pandemic has pushed a lot of things forward. So who knows where we're going to be in the next decade. It seems yep. to switch as soon as we think we know where we're going. Yep. It's uh, exponential very quickly. So yep. that's the exciting part. Well, I know we've talked a lot about a lot of great things today inside of the whole additive manufacturing ecosystem and what's been going on with things. Is there anything else that we, you'd like to share specifically while we're here? Nothing specific. I think that just the general thing is it's been fascinating to sit on the sidelines or be a part of an AM industry that's really kind of a revolution in manufacturing and to actually see it from the 
peanut gallery. I mean, to either be on the stage and fighting the good fight or sitting and watching other people fight the good fight. It's been great, and I've really generated a lot of good friends through the process. And I remember reading a lot of books and seeing a lot of the stuff in Silicon Valley when that came of age and all the people that were, you know, making computers and, and high-tech stuff in their garages. And so I've seen that from afar but never were able to participate. And it's just been a great joy to participate in it face-to-face -face as we have. And, you know, Rapid, AMUG, a lot of those events, the SFF, the Solid Freeform fa happens Fabrication. Happens right here. Yeah. Happens here, the yeah. symposium. is just getting to go eat pizza with those guys that you've been eating pizza with for 10 years. Wow, yeah. Uh, it's really nice to see. Yeah, that's a great part of the community and a part of actually getting reacquainted with people after... Yep especially this pandemic where we couldn't be face-to-face. -face. And yep. this is my first time having a face-to-face -face interview since then, so I really appreciate uh, yep. being here, and this has been wonderful to be at the UT campus and to do this. I'm looking forward to so much more, and I'm looking forward to seeing you at Rapid Plus TCT yep. this year. Yeah, and thank you very much. Thank you for having me on the podcast. I'm yeah. looking forward to listening and watching yeah, yeah. some of these yeah. podcasts yeah. going yeah. forward. Yeah, we got a lot of great stuff. So, yes, again, thank you for being part of the SME Additive Manufacturing Influencer Initiative and also being a podcast positive role model here inside of 3D printing. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adam.